former chief constable of Dorset, about the countryman inquiries into police corruption. Well, of course, Mr. Hambledon is now retired as chief constable. He was conducting this inquiry, and he is entitled to express his views. I hope we shall keep the matter in proportion. There will be no cover-up. Nobody is going to obstruct the work of the countryman inquiry. The commissioner of the Metropolitan Police and I have both made that clear on abundantly many occasions, and so has the commission of police of the city. That will not happen. But at the same time, it's only right the investigation should be allowed to proceed without... I, I don't like the idea of casting slurs on people before it has become plain that they should be prosecuted in the courts. But if there are wrongdoers, if there are those who've done wrong, then they must be prosecuted in the courts. Do you feel that Mr. Hambledon was perhaps putting slurs on people before they'd been brought to trial? I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say he must speak as he wishes, and it's not for me to comment on what he says. Were you surprised, or are you indeed shocked, as he said he was, that some 25 uh, police officers, senior police officers, might be facing trial? That, oh, certainly, anyone who has my responsibility uh, in the country as Home Secretary, anyone who has responsibility for the police service is bound to be worried about that. But I think one's got to put it into perspective. Of course we have the wrongdoers. There are wrongdoers in every walk of society in our country. Every walk of society. But I think it must be remembered, where there may be one wrongdoer in the police service, there are many hundreds of dedicated police officers doing their very best, loyally and with complete integrity for our community, and that must be remembered too. Mr. William Whitelaw, and the Home Secretary's lecture that I mentioned earlier can be seen on Westwood tonight at 10.36. Well, we're going to take a short break on the diary now, but we'll be back in just a couple of minutes with uh, fishing, sport, Ivan Novello, and yes, the noble art of window cleaning. So I hope you'll stay with us.
Welcome back. On January the 15th, 1893, David Ivor Davis was born in Cardiff. His mother, a beautiful dark-eyed woman named Clara, gave piano and singing lessons. It was steeped in this musical atmosphere that young David grew up, and by the age of eight he was taking lessons himself. Clara's great ambition was for David to become a composer, and as the boy progressed, she persuaded him to change his name to something more romantic, something more in line with being a music maker. And so she chose the name of her own Italian music teacher. The name was Novello, and the rest, as they say, is history. Ivor Novello died 29 years ago this week, acknowledged the world over as a superb composer, actor, writer, and the ultimate matinee idol. For the next few weeks, West Country theatre-goers can share a celebration of his life in a production at the Northcott Theatre in Exeter. The show, Ivor, is pure entertainment, built, as you'd expect, around those Novello songs. We'll let the Northcott Theatre Company explain how one of Novello's greatest and best love songs came to be written. With the war to end wars came a flood of patriotic songs. Mam pestered Ivor to jump onto the bandwagon with his own war song, but Ivor refused to cash in on the Vogue. So Mam determinedly played her trump card. Very well, Ivor. If you won't write one, I will. Soon afterwards, he was treated to its first performance. It was terrible. Victory, as it was called, was in fact so appalling that Ivor realised the only way to avoid the embarrassment of Mam's song being performed in public was to yield and write his own. A week later, at the Alhambra Theatre, it was performed by Sybil Vane. The audience was in rather a quiet mood that afternoon. The anxieties of the war had dampened their spirits, and the first song she sang, which usually went very well, had a rather cool reception. When the time came, she sang the verse and the chorus, and when she began to repeat the chorus, it seemed to me that I heard voices in the audience singing it with her. And then, suddenly, like magic, everyone stood up and sang the entire chorus together. And I knew that I had the first great success of my career as a composer. <laughs> 